Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Michael Osman of Great Scott Gadgets. Um, we are uh, uh, one of the uh, sponsors of the event, and uh, so you should go see us and all the other fine vendors in the vendor area when you get a chance. Um, I am also the designer of HackRF1, which is kind of how I got into thinking a lot about low-cost SDR platforms. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about HackRF1, but also other low-cost platforms that are out there, uh, because uh, I think that there's uh, there's a lot of interest in the low end. There's a lot of interest in in low-cost hardware platforms that people can use, especially to get into SDR for the first time. Uh, so if you're new to SDR and you don't have any hardware platforms, or if you know somebody who's new to SDR, or you think somebody if somebody you know might want to start getting into it uh, as a hobby or just for fun, uh, that maybe doesn't have a big budget, um, there are some nice low-cost options out there that uh, that people can use to get uh, get into the field. And so th these are the two platforms that I think everyone should know about, kind of at the low end. Uh, of the cost spectrum for uh, software-defined radio platforms. And uh, the RTL-SDR platform is a uh, repurposed TV tuner USB dongle. And so these are sold uh, online. Uh, mostly we get them online in the US because uh, they're, they're designed for DVB-T, which is a, a, a television standard that we don't use for in, in the US. Um, but it's very popular in Europe, for example. And so there are these low-cost uh, TV tuners that are sold uh, for various markets, including Europe, that uh, you can buy online, and they can be repurposed as a software-defined radio receiver. The, and the cost you know, tends to be, uh, it depends a lot on how, where you get them, but like if, you, if you don't mind ordering from places in China and wondering when it will arrive. Like you can get these for about $10. Um, if you want to buy more locally, like from some place in the US, for example, uh, you can get usually get them from around $20. And, uh, and so the, the capabilities that they give you vary a little bit from model to model. Um, the, the, the name RTL SDR is actually actually comes from uh, some software that's used with them, uh, but RTL stands for real t real tech. Uh, it is a um, or it's or it's a it's the abbreviation for a, check, a chip that comes from real tech. And so all of these RTL SDR dongles or all of these TV tuner dongles that are supported by the RTL SDR software, uh, they all use the same real tech uh, chip. And it's really a, a two chip board. There's there's the Realtek chip, which has the uh, um, baseband, analog to digital converter, and an actual TV um, demodulator uh, function that you don't use if you're using it for SDR. And it has the USB interface all on that Realtek chip. And then there's a second chip that's, that's the tuner chip. And that just uh, basically is a, a way to shift the frequency. Uh, so, so what gives it a wide frequency range is that tuner chip. Uh, and exactly what tuner chip is installed on a particular uh, particular dongle is somewhat variable. And if you're just buying a $10 one from China, you might not really know what tuner chip you'll get. Uh, but if you're buying a $20 one in the US, you can probably f find out uh, what chip that is. The uh, approximate range, and this varies depending on what tuner chip is installed primarily, is from about 50 megahertz to about 2 gigahertz. Uh, which is a really nice wide range that covers a lot of interesting things that people uh, like to investigate with SDR, uh, including FM broadcast band, which is a great kind of first step, sort of the hello world of SDR is often receiving FM broadcast, um, and uh, lots of cellular bands, TV bands, uh, all kinds of things. Um, and uh, the amount of bandwidth that it gives you, which is, of course, a function of its sample rate, is about two megahertz. I think the, the most, the highest I've gotten these to work reliably is about 2.4 megahertz. Uh, so you can pick up any signal that has a bandwidth of up to about two megahertz, uh, which again, covers a lot of interesting things, uh, but not everything. And um, one of the important limitations to know about the Realtek dongles 
or the RTL SDR dongles is that they are receive only. And so this is a nice low cost option, but it's receive only. Uh, the reason I think Hacker F1 is important to know about is because it is the lowest cost general purpose transceiver. You can transmit or receive uh, with Hacker F1. And uh, you know, it's an order of magnitude more expensive, but it gives you a much wider operating frequency range, uh, wider bandwidth, for both receive and transmit, and it gives you half duplex uh, transceive. So you can transmit or receive, but not at the same time. And these are kind of the two, the two, the two platforms that I think everyone should know about and that we can kind of compare other options against kind of the lowest cost receiver that you can buy that's fairly general purpose and the lowest cost transmitter that you can buy that's fairly general purpose. Um, and uh, uh, there are some other things that are out there, uh, especially more recently, there are some things that have become available kind of between these two anchor points that I think are, are interesting. Um, and so you might think of these as kind of enhanced RTL SDR platforms or, or uh, or a HackRF Lite kind of capability than cost. And some of the things that fit into this category in, in between those uh, are things like AirSpy and SDR Play. Um, and these are some, some newer platforms that are out there that give you like more bandwidth than a Realtek dongle, but are only, re that are receive only, for example. Um, and all of the things that, have, that I've found in this category, and these are just some examples that I've written up here, all of the things I've found in this category are receive only, uh, but they tend to be better receivers than the RTL SDR. Uh, the NESDR Smart uh, is one example of several boards that are out there now that are basically uh, Realtek dongles, but they've been kind of redesigned with specifically with SDR usage in mind instead of being designed just for the TV market. And so one of the nice things about the NESDR Smart, for example, is that it has an SMA connector, uh, and which is a lot more useful uh, for general purpose SDR, at least in this country, um, than the PAL connectors that you find on a lot of the, uh, the low cost TV tuner dongles. So that's just you know, one example of the kinds of enhancements that, that certain manufacturers are making to these, uh, these real tech dongles to make them more uh, appropriate for SDR use. Another nice uh, innovation that's happening in that space lately is that people have figured out how to use the, the uh, real tech chip to do direct sampling. Uh, so kind of bypassing that mixer chip and and being able to do direct sampling of stuff that's under 50 megahertz. Um, and so uh, you, can, uh, you can do that, but it's a hardware hack. Unless you buy one of these enhanced Realtek dongles that's being uh, designed specifically with SDR users in mind, um, that gives you the ability oftentimes, uh, to, you, can, you can find one of those kind of better SDR, uh, RTL SDR dongles, either from Newelec or from uh, RTLSDR.com, I think, the blog uh, is doing these, and um, I think there might be one or two other people who are companies that are kind of putting out these, these enhanced Realtek dongles that give you, sometimes they might give you direct sampling capability, sometimes they might give you a better clock, sometimes they might give you uh, a different connector, so minor enhancements that don't cost very much. Uh, so a lot of these are available for, say, under $30. So if you just spend a few dollars more uh, and go for one of those kind of enhanced Realtek dongles, uh, you, can, you can have a, a, you know, a platform that gives you some more capabilities that uh, you know, people who are just trying to tune to TV stations don't really care about. Um, so I've spent a lot of time thinking about what makes hardware for software-defined radio expensive. And this is totally unscientific, uh, just kind of uh, my opinion about what features, what aspects of software-defined radio platforms uh, affect the cost and how much. Uh, for example, um, I added clock synchronization to HackRF1 because that didn't cost very much. Uh, I was trying to make a low-cost platform and it turned out that didn't cost very much to add, so I put it in there. 
like you can think of these things as what can you add or enhance and how much do they add to the cost? Or you can think of them as what can you strip out of a higher end platform and how much would that allow you to reduce the cost? Uh, so like reducing the bandwidth of a hardware platform might uh, be able to reduce the cost a moderate amount. Um, but the thing that kind of stands out to me of everything that I've considered uh, is frequency range. If you can limit the frequency range of, a, of an SDR receiver or transceiver, um, if you can limit it to, say, one frequency instead of many frequencies, you can reduce the cost a whole lot um, in a, in a software-defined radio platform. It affects the, uh, a, a number of different components. It affects filtering, uh, it affects mixing, it affects frequency synthesis, um, and, and like frequency synthesis tends to be a, a fairly expensive thing when you're, when you're building a hardware platform, for example. So this, this has kind of gotten me thinking about like what, what can we do to make even lower cost platforms or more variety of low cost platforms in the future for software defined radio and I, and uh, or, or e either that we as a community can make or that you know we Grace Scott gadgets can make or that people can uh, make for themselves uh, if you're an electronics hobbyist or you want to get into that um, maybe you'd like to kind of build a special purpose SDR platform because um, limiting the frequency range is a way that you can make this kind of technology much easier and more affordable uh, kind of to assemble yourself. And so one, one example of this is, uh, this is a Soft Rock 40, which is a, a design that's, I think, at least 10 years old, uh, that's somewhat popular in the amateur radio community. And I, if I recall correctly, the reason it's called 40 is because it was made for the 40 meter band, but there are variants of this for a whole bunch of different amateur radio bands, uh, all of which, uh, or for the most part, they're, they're um, in the HF bands, so like 30 megahertz and below uh, in frequency. Uh, so nothing super high frequency. Uh, on the, on the left-hand side, uh, the, in the upper left-hand corner is an antenna connector, and in the lower left-hand corner is an audio connector, and that plugs into the sound card of your computer and you use the analog to digital converter on your computer uh, as part of the software defined radio, which means it's only operating at audio sample rates, very low bandwidth. Uh, if you're only sampling at say 48,000 samples per second, uh, then, and if you're doing it in a quadrature manager, manner, then you're going to only have 48 kilohertz of bandwidth, and that's pretty low bandwidth for SDR standards, right? Like the stuff Matt was showing or the stuff we do with HackRF, we, uh, we're typically dealing with megahertz of bandwidth, not kilohertz of bandwidth. But there are a lot of interesting applications out there uh, that you can accomplish with kilohertz of bandwidth, a lot of special purpose applications. And so you can make kind of ultra low cost SDR platforms like the SoftRock 40, uh, or the many, many variants of the soft rock that have come out over the years. Uh, you can make these things at an extremely low cost compared to the cost of more general purpose SDR platforms. And I think it's important not to overlook that. Uh, a lot of us work with general purpose platforms and we're kind of spoiled by the ability to use a single platform for a whole lot of different applications. Um, but there are certain applications or uh, certain folks who might have a, a might be able to use a special purpose uh, application as a way to get into SDR and to start experimenting with SDR that they wouldn't be able to before. Now on the right hand side of the screen, uh, you notice there's a USB connector, but I'm pretty sure that's just there for power. Uh, so uh, this, is not a, this is not a sophisticated digital design. It doesn't actually have a USB interface. It is basically uh, just a mixer and filter and that's it. Um, and it's receive only. But, um, and I think there are some components on the back side, but not very many. So you're seeing most of it right there. It's pretty easy to build yourself. It's very affordable. Uh, you can buy these or newer variants of the soft rock kind of platform. Uh, you can buy fully assembled, I think, for less than $100. Uh, and you can build them yourself for quite a bit less than that as well. Uh, I've been kind of toying with something along 
along these lines. Uh, I have a hardware platform that I'm working on right now called GreatFet, which is a, it's just a microcontroller uh, kind of a system that plugs in over a high-speed USB to a computer. And um, it's, kind of, it's kind of a general purpose hardware hacking platform. But one of the things you can do with it is kind of add components to it on a breadboard. And I thought it might be fun to do a breadboard SDR project, um, doing something similar to what the SoftRock 40 does, um, a special purpose SDR receiver that could be implemented just by plugging in several components into a breadboard and then uh, sampling it using the microcontroller on the on the great fed. I think that'll be a lot of fun, and it's something that I'm I'm looking forward to working on uh, in the coming months. And it's and it's something that I would encourage anyone to do if you if you have any interest in electronics and you have any interest in SDR. Uh, it's not a uh, it's not a terribly difficult uh, pr project to to try to take on, and you can you can learn a lot about both electronics and. SDR in the process. Um, along the lines of being kind of specific to uh, a special purpose or specific to a particular frequency, the uh, one of the things I've been working on lately uh, is this little board that uh, is just an inline filter and amplifier that, in this case, is plugged into a hacker between a HackRF and its antenna. Uh, and it can be used for other platforms as well, but the HackRF happens to have a, uh, a low power, kind of a DC uh, power output that it can put on its antenna port, so it can power a little amplifier like this. And this is an example of how you can take uh, kind of a general purpose platform that um, uh, is kind of a jack of all trades and make it perform better for a particular band. Uh, at a fairly low cost. There aren't very many components on this little board, but it, it is a filter and low noise amplifier for a particular band of interest, and it enhances the perfor performance a whole lot. Matt was talking about dynamic range and about uh, you know, various impairments that can happen in a system, and, and a lot of those impairments uh, come, can come from uh, like uh, interferers in nearby bands or even not so nearby bands. And having a little analog filter like this can cut out a lot of that stuff and, uh, and make your system perform better. The, and kind of in general, I think that, uh, you know, I, I really like the, the title of Matt's talk, you know, why doesn't my signal look like the textbook? And I, in general, I think, Kind of the more money you spend on your uh, on your hardware, the more like the textbook your signal should look, right? So if you're <laughs> if you're sp deliberately spending very very little on your hardware, you're going to end up with potentially more impairments or more things that you have to deal with in software. And that's that's one of my favorite things about SDR is that you can correct hardware problems by using software or you can use lower cost hardware if you don't mind doing the work in software to make up for any deficiencies that your hardware may have. And that's a great trade-off that we have at our disposal uh, that people didn't have before the days of software-defined radio. Uh, another project that I'm working on right now, um, like it'll be finished and ready to prototype any day now, uh, is a full duplex add-on for Hacker F1. Um, it's just an add-on board that plugs in and lets you transmit and receive at the same time. Uh, it's not going to be particularly low cost. I mean, like compared to existing full duplex platforms that are out there, uh, but it'll be a nice add-on for folks who already have a Hacker F1, definitely. Um, and then, the, kind of the next thing that I, I've, I've already starting to work on, but it's going to take a little bit longer uh, to get out, is a uh, code name Marzipan, which is uh, kind of the next Hacker F1 that we're working on that will be uh, an embedded SDR platform. So it'll, it'll be basically the same radio capabilities as Hacker F1, uh, but you can run Linux on it. And um, so it's, it'll be a little bit more expensive than Hacker F1, of course, um, but for its capabilities, I hope that it, it is a, a good uh, cost, uh, you know, bang for buck. Um, but looking beyond Marzipan, I, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that with the HackRF project, we have something 
uh, that is that is kind of special. I mean, it's an open source hardware project, and that alone, I think, is special. But but it is uh, the the lowest cost the lowest cost general purpose, uh, you know, really uh, a wide range of capability. Um, or a wide range of application, I'd say. It's a lowest cost, general purpose, SDR transceiver uh, that's out there. And uh, that's an important distinction, I think, and something that the HackRF project should try to, uh, try to maintain and try to, try to do better. And one of the things that I've thought about, like if we make a HackRF after Marzipan, um, instead of going more expensive, I might try to go less expensive and do something like a uh, lower bandwidth uh, HackRF uh, transceiver uh, for somewhere around half the cost of a HackRF one. Uh, I think this might be interesting for folks. Um, and I've looked at some ways that this could be done. There are some newer, uh, newer integrated circuits on the market that, that make this achievable, I think, uh, without having to do, get into custom silicon or anything like that. Um, but uh, that's the trade-off that I see is that in the future, we can probably, uh, in the near future, we can probably uh, lower the, band, the bandwidth quite a bit to save cost. And I think that that may be useful for a lot of people. I mean, certainly people have found things in the one to two megahertz bandwidth range very uh, interesting and usable, uh, and that's kind of proven by the RTL SDR uh, project and the success and the, the popularity of, of that uh, platform. And uh, so if we have a lower bandwidth platform that's a transceiver, it would be a way for, uh, to, make, to make transmitting with SDR more accessible. And so you could have a, a whole environment where you have a transmitter and a receiver uh, and be able to do over the air experiments of all sorts uh, at, a, at a very low cost. Um, and so if you're interested in this thing uh, or any of the other things I've talked about, uh, I would love to, to chat with you over the next few days. Um, of course, we're over at the vendor area and I'll be at the conference a lot. Um, and uh, uh, this, this project in particular, this kind of next generation, uh, lower cost HackRF is something that uh, I'd love to get feedback on from, from the community. Uh, if you're, new to, if you're new to Software Defined Radio or you know people who are new to Software Defined Radio, uh, I just want to point out that I have a, a video series online. Uh, this is a free open content uh, series and um, it's called SDR with HackRF, but you don't actually need a HackRF to go through it. Uh, that's just sort of the platform I base it on. And uh, it's, a, it's a good opportunity, I think, for people to learn, especially the fundamentals of DSP uh, that a lot of folks uh, who are just getting into SDR for the first time uh, may not have a background in. And uh, another thing I want to mention uh, before I wrap up is that uh, we're having an open house at our lab uh, at Great Scott Gadgets in Evergreen, which is about a 45 minute drive from here. Um, and uh, that's Friday night. So uh, if you stop by our booth, pick up a map uh, and come to our open house, we'd love to see you there. Uh, we are local, we live uh, are in the area and work uh, in Evergreen, Colorado, and uh, so we're kind of pleased to be, uh, be able to be here and uh, kind of be your local guide if we can. Uh, so if you have questions about like, you know, what should you do on Saturday or something, um, ask us because we have all kinds of ideas. And uh, we'd love to see you at our open house. Just stop by the booth and find out some information. And um, I think we have a couple minutes for questions. Yes. Working on it, working on it. Oh, Michael's bringing a microphone. All right. Hi, um, going back to what drives costs. Yeah. I've always wondered if you look at the, the RTL SDR is $20 and yeah. yet the receivers are the more complicated thing. <laughs> and then as soon as you put a transmitter in it, you jump up almost $300. So what is it about the transmitter that's driving costs so much? That's an excellent question. Um, so, and I, I love the fact that you point out that receiving is harder than transmitting um, because uh, that makes me wonder, what are you doing at the new user's day? Because, uh, because that's something that uh, when I'm teaching SDR to people, that's something that I, I always try to uh, make clear 
is that receiving is a lot harder than transmitting. And like I always focus on teaching people receiving much more than I teach people transmitting because if you, if you learn how to receive, you can figure out how to transmit. But if you only learn how to transmit, you're gonna have a hard time figuring out how to receive, right? Uh, there are a lot more problems to deal with. But those problems are primarily problems in an SDR architecture. Those problems that we have to deal with are primarily software problems, not hardware problems. Uh, and the problem of building an SDR transmitter versus an SDR receiver, if you're only looking at the hardware part of it and not the software part, uh, there isn't that big distinction where receiving is a whole lot harder than transmitting, uh, I don't think. And so um, the main reason why uh, RTL SDR platforms are so ridiculously inexpensive is because they're mass produced with silicon that is made for a special purpose. It just so happens that this special purpose uh, includes a pretty wide range of frequencies that they want these things to tune to. And it just so happens that they chose an SDR kind of architecture internally that we can benefit from. And so if you were building custom silicon and you were building millions and millions of them, um, then you could get things with similar transmit capabilities at about the same cost point, I think. But excellent question. Uh, I'm curious, when you go back to the, uh, your work on the full duplex, uh, can you give us more details on that? And also, where is that being, what's the customer drive for that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's, uh, so this is basically, uh, you're seeing a screenshot of uh, like the KiCad design of, uh, um, of the board. And if you've looked at the Hack RF1 design, it may look familiar to you because the RF section that is in that rectangle, rectangular area in the lower left uh, is identical to the RF section that's on Hack RF1. So Hack RF1 actually has part of the board full, du full duplex capable and part of the board only half duplex capable. And the part of the board that's half duplex is the RF. The baseband is is full duplex, the analog to digital converters, digital to analog converters can run at the same time, the USB interface can handle traffic going both directions to some extent, uh, you know, at a reduced bandwidth anyway. And uh, so everything's kind of uh, full duplex from the USB all the way to baseband, uh, analog baseband. And so it's just the analog baseband to the antenna, that RF section that's, in, that's under that shield there, that, that rectangular area. Uh, it's just that section that is half duplex. So the idea with Neapolitan, which is just a code name for the project, uh, is that we just take, we just duplicate that RF section and put it on an add-on board. So we have two of them. One of the interesting, uh, one of the interesting side effects of that is that not only can we transmit and receive at the same time, but we could receive on two different frequencies at the same time, or transmit on two different frequencies at the same time instead of transmitting and receiving at the same time. Um, and uh, we may retain that capability in the final version. I'm not sure. It depends kind of on feedback I get uh, at this stage. But uh, it's an interesting question to, to, to wonder, you know, wh what's the driver for this? Well, I get people asking me all the time, when are you going to come out with a full duplex hack RF? When are you going to come out with a full duplex hack RF? And most of the time I say, you know, there are already good full duplex options out there. There are all these USRPs and the Blade RF and all kinds of good stuff um, that isn't that much more expensive than like say two hack RFs or whatever this is gonna cost. Um, and, uh, and so why don't you just use one of those platforms? And, and some people, uh, and for some people that's a good answer, but for other people oftentimes the answer is, well, I already have a hack RF. And like, I wouldn't mind spending a little bit more to have an add on board uh, instead of having to buy a whole new hardware platform. So I think this is a, a fairly compelling option for people who happen to already have uh, the lower cost platform. Uh, the applications that people are interested in, I think the biggest one is, is cellular, um, like base station stuff. Um, and, uh, and one of the other limitations of cellular uh, applications is clock stability. And so, I'm um, uh, actually the, the only remaining part that I haven't finished 
in the design of this right now is I've been adding on some extra clocking options just to play with them uh, so that we can prototype some different clocking options that may or may not end up on the final version of this thing. Uh, did I answer your question, Tom? Uh, yes, just one more follow on. So for me, full duplex, usually when we talk about it, we're talking about single antenna full duplex. This is not that. Correct. This would be dual antenna full duplex. Uh, right. Okay, thanks. Yeah. That is all the time we have. Thank you all very much.